guys, well, welcome back to TAM Talks, a place for real and honest conversation. And I am so excited about our guest today. So whether you're watching me on my YouTube channel or you're listening to our podcast, it's our it's our joy today to have our guest, Brian Barcelona. Now, Brian, um, thank you. Good looking guy. God's doing great things in your life. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's so good to be with you, Pastor Tammy. Well, first of all, let's just set the stage. Um, you were just with us here in Anaheim, California last week here at Influence Church, and we had a youth rally with Gen Z, and we're seeing God move. And I'm in a series right now talking about revival in America. So I don't think there's anybody better to bring us up to speed and educate us with what's happening with Gen Z in America. So why don't you just take it from here, introduce yourself, and talk to us about the revival in America. Yeah, you know, I, I think I said this on on Sunday that um, I, I acknowledge that I believe our nation is in a spiritual awakening. Um, it's something that I prayed for for a long time, but I think generations before me have prayed for for decades more. And I don't know, um, you know, if we've seen something quite like this since, from what I've heard since the 70s, where it's all over the place, God is breaking out. And there seems to be a, a health to what God's doing in the sense that, uh, you know, you look at Asbury, it just, it didn't get wonky. It didn't get funky. I mean, it was, everything I heard was repentance. It was his presence. It was, uh, you know, it was, it was, you know, it wasn't about big glamorous speakers and, so I think what we're seeing in Gen Z is that it's a, you know, it's it's a purity in, in what God is doing. So it, yep, it's amazing yep. to watch. You know, one one of the things that one of our Gen Zers said is that they're just looking for something that's authentic. And you know, Brian, I'm I'm like really emotional right now. I think I, it's just the winds of revival from our women's conference we just had, and from you being here and me seeing all these kids. So. Um, I really believe that they've been so robbed and lied to through this pandemic, and they're just looking for truth. And as we know, Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. They just want Jesus. And so tell me a little bit about where you are, where you're going. I know you're in high school, so you're seeing this. So tell us as, as grandparents and parents, what do we need to do to stir this revival with this next generation? You know, I... I'll never forget. I had a mentor who's passed away now. He was uh, his name is Brian Brent. He started the Circuit Riders. Mm -hmm. I remember one time I went to him and I says, Brian, what do I do? You know, there's people, you know, battling this and this and this. And he said this to me. He goes, you know, Brian, sometimes you have to discern whether someone needs a rebuke or someone needs a root beer float. Wow. And I never forgot that statement because uh, I think when you're dealing with young people. Um, rarely are the ones that are getting saved. Rarely do they mean their rebellion. Rarely do they mean their dishonor. Rarely do they mean um, the things that they're going through. A lot of it's just their age. And I was talking to an older leader from IHOP last week, and he was saying this. He said, you know, Brian, my generation, they called us the Joshuas. Um, you know, and then when we didn't really fulfill all that they thought God had for us, they were onto the millennials, and you guys were the world changers and the history makers. And he goes, my fear with Gen Z is when we place all this pressure that they have to fulfill this mm -hmm. grand plan of God. And if they fall short of it, my fear is that we discard them and we are on to the next generation. And I think what, what I've captured from that is with all that God's doing, saving Gen Z, what I heard from the 70s was when all these hippies got saved, there was a lot of discipleship that needed to take place. I don't know if it fully happened with everyone. But I think we're in the same thing. You're getting kids that are saved out of this, um, you know, very different mindsets. You have the the transgender movement that has been sweeping their generation, the LGBTQ. You have um, the, the political battles. You have COVID. You have all these narratives that have fought for their attention. And then you also have something that no other generation has had. It's called the cell phone uh, and, and the consumption of information at a young age. And so I think that we are seeing God move powerfully, um, but it's going to be accompanied by people fathering and mothering these kids. Mm -hmm. And to me, what that simply means is the same way you would with your own children. You're patient, you're kind, you know, they, they make the same mistakes a thousand times. But as their mom, you're just like, you know, get over here. You know, I love you. It's OK. And I think having that same mindset uh, as parents for this next generation is key. 
That's beautifully said. You know, Brian, let's talk about it because you said this on Sunday. This is a revival for our culture. So, we're, you know, it's being labeled, you know, this Gen Z <clears throat> revolution. Obviously, the Jesus Revolution movie just came out <clears throat> and it was beautifully done. And we're all hungry for this revolution, for this revival, for this awakening. We as people are. I know here at Influence Church, we just finished a 21 day fast and we're believing God. One of the things specifically was for revival in America. So the church is waking up. We know we need revival. So I agree with you and concur. Let's don't put the pressure on a a group of people like the Gen Z. But I do think what happens is they open our eyes to something fresh yeah. and new. They're so raw and vulnerable yeah. and honest. And it's something that we, as the older generation, need to get back to the roots of the purity and the honesty of this generation. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I, I remember I got a little bit of flack for our name, Gen Z for Jesus. I would have people say, well, that's not in the Bible. And I'm like, oh, at that point, when someone responds like that, I don't know if there's much I can say to help them with their thinking. But I, I, I you know, I, I said this. Why did God choose Moses' generation? And of all those years, he could have freed any generation. He chose that one. I don't know. Why is God sovereignly moving in Gen Z? Why didn't he move like that in millennials? I don't know. But I do acknowledge and embrace that he's moving. Mm -hmm. And so I think for us, even our name Gen Z for Jesus is more of a declaration. It's... Uh, as culture has tried to label all of this generation, um, I, I just think God has a different narrative. Mm -hmm. And that was even our heart in, in, you know, saying Gen Z for Jesus. It was a declaration. And even our gatherings, they are not just for young people. We urge parents and grandparents to come. I, I would tell parents this, hey, when you go to Disneyland, do you drop off your kids? Or do you get down with them and you spend the entire day spending thousands of dollars waiting in long lines, but you're making memories. Amen. I said, that's what parents need to realize. Don't drop off your kids at, at, a, at a gathering like this. Come and experience history with them. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's funny. You, you made reference to that, what we call Jesus movement, which I can say I was a part of it. And you did call us out on Sunday. Hey, what is up with like saying, I know, I know you people are part of it. Cause you, you, you look old. You basically <laughs> said you old people look old. So I know you were part of it. So you called us out, but the truth is yes. And there's so many similarities, Brian, because it, listen, I grew up one of those girls at the age of 15 <clears throat> that was going to all night prayer night meetings with guitars. <clears throat> you know, our church had a coffee house and literally we saw hippies coming in. We saw guys coming back from Vietnam. We saw, so it wasn't maybe um, wow. gender identity or maybe it wasn't um, the issues of COVID, but we had our own issues. Our world was fighting Vietnam war. Our world was fighting this new group of people called hippies, LSD, all that kind of stuff. So it was just different. See, the enemy does, it doesn't matter. He doesn't have a new creative strategy. He just goes after society. So we had our own issues, but literally we had all night prayer meetings and we would pray and we'd see people come in and get, you know, saved and redeemed. And so again, there was a movement, a, I'll call it a dispensation, Brian, a period of time yeah in America, that Holy Spirit birthed his breath. He just breathed over us as a nation. And you made a great reference on Sunday. You showed us different periods, whether it was YWAM or circuit riders. Or so there've been movements, but I do think this movement is going deeper. I do think that yes. it really is affecting all generations Agreed. across the board. What do you think? I agree. I agree. And I think we're in a unique time. I mean, if you think about this, my grandfather is alive. My father is alive. I'm alive. And my son is alive. I have four generations right now. That's not going to be the case in 20 more years. Mm -hmm. my, my, the fathers in the faith that I adore and admire and the mothers in the faith, you know, they're, they're passing. You know, I, I mentioned it earlier at the, at the church, you know, Lauren Cunningham, who has maybe weeks, months to live. Mm -hmm. You know, Lou Ingalls, you know, getting in his mid-70s. I'm not saying that that's old, but... These fathers are getting older. I don't know if we're going to have them for 15, 20 more years. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is the time for moms and dads to impart everything that you got, all of your stories, all of your wisdom, um, your resources. I mean, I remember this lady that funded what I did in, in L.A. She was the reason why One Voice exploded in schools all over uh, the Los Angeles area. She was an 89-year-old woman who funded me. And 
she said, my goal is to die empty. Amen. You know, she, she wasn't looking to go and she's like, I don't want to go on cruises and all that. She goes, I just, she, she would always tell me this. She goes, Brian, save America. That's Amen. what she'd always tell me. Yep. And so I, I look at my life. I could not do anything without that, what that woman did. Yeah. You know, she never went on a campus. She never preached. She hated public recognition, mm -hmm. but she fueled all the gospel work that we did for many, yep. many years. Well, you know, Brian, you know, it's so true. And the thing <clears throat> we have to remember is God will always have his remnant. You know, so often we are so fearful that um, we're going to lose a, a decade or we're going to lose a generation. But if you read the word of God, what I see is the pattern of Israel in the Old Testament that they get so far from God and so far from God and so far from God that they had nowhere to go but to repent. And I think over the last three or four generations, we've gotten so far and so far and so far. And then Satan overplayed his hand. The enemy overplayed his hand with COVID. He brought fear and dissension and confusion. Churches shut down. People became, again, fearful. He overplayed his hand. And it's now time for us to repent right? To confess and to return. And that's what I think we're seeing. God will always have his remnant. So I am hopeful for America like I've yeah. never been before. I believe we're seeing an awakening and a revival, but here's what I want to say, something I love to do. You have to speak it. You have to profess it. You have to decree it and declare it and talk about what God's doing, not what the enemy's doing. So let's talk about what God's doing right now through you in these high schools with kids. Tell us about the revivals and the meetings and give us some hope and some encouragement because God is moving. Yes. I want to, I want to um, say something just really quick about what you're saying. Cause People I don't think realize, um, you know, they don't realize that what you're saying is actually a form of praise. There's a there's a Hebrew word for praise called Shabak. And Shabak means a holy roar. And the word Shabak means to address in a loud tone, to command, to triumph. But one of the places that that's used is Psalms 145, verse 4. One generation shall praise. The word praise is Shabak thy works to another just when you say declare and decree people a lot of times they might think ah maybe that's just a charismatic term no 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 that's a hebrew word that the older generation is to shout to the next generation and declare the 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 uh the works of god i mean it's it's very very biblical and so i just wanted uh just to, to, to say that and that's what's so happening what's happening across uh the nation and the nations right now is explosive. I mean, Jesus clubs has gotten into 45 countries, uh, you know, plus, and we're seeing all over now the U S including your own church that is now involved in local high schools. I mean, Alan, I think his first meeting they had of the year at 140 plus kids yes. in a gymnasium. Most youth groups aren't even 144 kids. And so I think we have to acknowledge that what's happening is God, yeah. but how do we respond to it? I think that's the key, you know, and I think this is where local churches that are seeing expressions of revival break out in their communities, through their, through their students, through their youth pastors. This is where they make room and they say, what do you need? Yep. What Amen. Do we need? We're in one school with 150 kids. How do we get into seven schools with 200 kids? Yep. You know, each, how do we multiply this? How do we, man, we, you know, Alan gathered over 200 young people. How do we start becoming a voice in the region for youth all over? Because not a lot of churches are like influence that have captured um, the mindset of God, uh, you know, nationwide and globally. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think those churches that are and that have, man, may you be a resource to bless so many people around you. Okay. Amen. I agree. I agree. I, I wanted. I want to talk about something a little controversial. You ready? Yeah. So the big issue back in the '70s were the hippies, you know. And I know that that today that today that's a style, you know. So today we with this kind of a cool style. But back then, seriously, the church did not want to open the doors. If you've watched the Jesus Revolution, you know that was a real yeah. issue even at that time yes. with Calvary Chapel, and yes. um and the lifestyle even at that time. But today's issue is things like transgender or um, homelessness or these other, and the church doesn't know what to do with these issues. We don't know how to incorporate or make place for these issues. And I'm being an honest and, and honest and raw, raw and vulnerable as I can, um, because that was an issue in my Baptist church growing up. We didn't 
our deacons did not want to bring the hippies in the church. So what they did was they bought a little house next to the church and we made it into a coffee house where it was a safe place for hippies to come. So at least they did something, you know, which thank God they did something. But do you realize churches are afraid of this emerging culture? They're afraid of the lifestyle. I mean, how do we break down the barrier as a church and love humanity without compromising conviction? You know, when whenever we hear the word um, Egypt, a lot of times our minds go to, you know, Pharaoh, bondage, slavery. But Egypt in the days of Joseph was prosperity and safety for the people of God. So how did prosperity and safety become a place of bondage? The people of God stood there too long. Mm -hmm. And I think what was freedom for one generation, if you hold on to those styles and think this is how denominations are formed. Maybe you met God throughout a, at somebody preaching from a wood pulpit. So everybody has to have a wood pulpit to preach. I, I think we acknowledge that God is moving in every generation uniquely. Um, and I do think that the, the LGBTQ, they, they would be equivalent to the hippies of, of today because the church doesn't quite know how yet to respond and, and if there's anything you learn from Jesus' revolution is that you make room. You don't compromise your beliefs or your or your faith or where you stand, but you make room. And I learned that with my own sister who was, um, you know, in a homosexual lifestyle for two years in a relationship with a woman who came to stay with us for a month. And I shared the gospel. And I'll never forget after she got saved, she said, well, I still have feelings for women. Mm -hmm. This is what she told me. Yeah. And I said, don't worry about that. Holy Spirit's in you. So now he can do his work. Amen. But if we're not willing to let them in the doors, how will Holy Spirit ever get inside of them Amen. to be able to bring that conviction? You can't be mad at someone for living. For, you can't be mad at someone for not living like a man they've never met. Amen. Amen. And I think That's we're good. so mad at all these people for the life. What, what else would they do? I mean, if you don't have Christ, there are Christians Amen. that have the Amen. Holy Spirit and yeah. they don't live like it. Amen. You know, people that don't have the Holy Spirit. So I, I think that we're to introduce them to God. And, you know, when the Holy Spirit's in there, it allows all of your words of truth to actually be received mm -hmm. uh, versus maybe you just speaking to someone that doesn't know God, trying yeah. to get them saved uh, on realizing how terrible their sin is. Amen. You know? Good word. You know, I remember uh, my mom saying to me, I grew up in a great home where my mom was the one who brought the hippies home and sat them around our table and, and <clears> just <throat> taught us to love. And I remember she said, until you have the heart to see the hippie for the person that God made them to be, you will never fully see humanity. Wow. And, you know, really began to teach us because once somebody, look, our, we sent us a group of our staff to Asbury. And they came back, we mentioned this to you, Brian, they came back so humble. I know Alan was one of them, so broken, our daughter, our missions pastor also. And here's what they said to you, you started our whole podcast with this. There was such a sense of humility and confession wow. and brokenness. And here's what happens. I want to say this to somebody that might have a little judgmental spirit. The lower you go, the more see, you see your own stuff. Yeah. The lower you go, the more you see your own stuff. True. And before you point a finger to someone in a in a gay lifestyle or an alcoholic or pornography or adultery or all the things we want to point our fingers at, I'm telling you what, the lower I go, the more God shows me my stuff. Wow. And I just, I don't have any room to place a finger anywhere other than to myself. And that's what brings about revival. And I'm telling you, and that's what the church has to do. We have to go low and see our yeah. own stuff. People have to see the splinter in their brother's eye through their log. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Good word. everyone Good has word. a log and yeah. we all have things that we navigate. And, you know, I've learned very quickly. You don't say I would never be me. Yeah. I think this mercy to me is a currency. Mm. And like a bank account, if you don't make deposits, you're not going to have much to withdraw. And, and, and so many, that's why when you see a pastor that has a failure, you don't be quick to judge them. Don't be quick to jump on social media, man, pray for those people pray. I mean, especially when you see people that aren't walking with the Lord, pray that they would know the Lord. Yeah. There was an old um, pastor that used to teach my husband. I mentored us and he said, never trust anyone without a limp. Yeah. Isn't that good? 
It's you know, true. until until you you've got to have that encounter, you know, you got to have that encounter where God touches the hip bone and you walk the rest of your life with a limp. It's and, true. you know, you just we all have to go there. So I would just say in our few moments together, let's talk a little bit to those that are listening. We talked about humility. We talked about confession and repentance and those things we have to do. We have to buy churches making way. Um, but let's let it, how do we pray? Because what we need to do, uh, this is a church, as you know, you've been here. We believe in prayer. <laughs> You know, if we were people of prayer, like we know Second Chronicles 714 says, if my people, that's my church and my people would what humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their ways. Right. That's the that's the ingredients. Then we're going to have that flowing out of that expression. I will turn. I will hear from heaven and I will heal your land. So talk to me in our last moments together about our country, about America, um, a word of encouragement. You might want to give us how we can pray for our country. Yeah, I think when you're praying, a couple things. Pray the word. Um, man, take that Bible and you pray that Bible over people. You also see that there is a direct connection in the New Testament between the number of laborers uh, to those who would pray them in. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into the harvest field. And obviously, you've probably heard that word send forth is ekbalo. And Iqbalo is, you know, is the same word that Jesus used when he casted out demons. He Iqbalo demons. And so when you pray, pray the Lord would, would Iqbalo labors, uh, that, that, that people would go and they would take the gospel. Also, to me, uh, the greatest evangelists are the intercessors because they have the connection to the heart of God for those they're preaching to. You, do I believe you can preach without praying? Yeah, you can share the word. But do I believe that you have the same effect? As the one that connects with the heart of God, no, it's different. And I think if you know, and, and if you're praying for the lost or you're praying for somebody to get saved and there's a fence with that person, maybe you're offended. I meet so many parents. I had a parent just this, yeah, last night I preached in North Carolina. She goes, man, that was such a good word. My daughter encountered God. Pray for my daughter. She goes, sometimes I just want to smack her upside her head to get right. And she goes, but that that's what my mom did. And and, and I just, you know, I, I, and I told her, I said, well, ma'am, I don't know about all that. I said, but you got to trust the Lord with your daughter. I said, if Moses's mom could let his, her son go in a basket to be raised by a wicked government and she trusted God, I said, I think you can trust the Lord that he got your daughter. And so I think that you would just pray that you wouldn't be offended with those people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and if, if, and if you're a grandma and a grandpa listening, a mother and a father, oh, your prayers are just desperately needed. Amen. Okay. So on a sidebar, you just gave a prophetic word to my producer in your illustration. God, <laughs> literally. And it was the Moses being let go uh, by her mother. Uh, she's a Jewish mama sitting right here that just had that word prophesied over her at our women's retreat wow. from Leanne Matheson at Awaken Church. And she wow. is looking at me with tears in her eyes right now because you are the second person to prophesy that word over her. And you know what, Brian, that's just what God does. I mean, everybody listening right now, you, you're witness right now to God moving in the spirit realm right now through a word coming out of a man of God to a woman of God who is a confirmation, let, let her boy go. God loves that boy. And so I'm saying to someone right now, the greatest gift you can give your child is to be an intercessor, to be a prayer warrior. And what's in your hand that you need to release right now? It might be finances to fund a ministry like Brian. He's doing the work. He's got four kids at home and a new baby and a wife. Yet he's heeded the call to go around the world to touch Gen Z. Get on your face and pray for this ministry. Pray for your pastors. Pray for your churches. Pray for Holy Spirit. Pray for that cultural group of people that you are judgmental toward. Let's pray. Let's seek God's face and pray. And let's believe in revival for our nation. Yeah. You know, I would also say too, if you don't value intercession, then you must remember what Jesus is doing up in heaven right now. I mean, Jesus has the highest seat, you know, up there. He's sitting at the right hand of the father. And what is he? He's an intercessor. Amen. I mean, what does that tell you? It tells you yeah. that in heaven, the great position is not a preacher. It's an intercessor. Amen. Wow. Well, I don't think it's going to get any better than that word right there. But and and you know what, Brian, let's close with this. I mean, prayer is hard. Remember that the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And I'm going to say to somebody yeah. right now, prayer is hard, 
because you're coming against spiritual warfare and spiritual forces, but you must learn to contend. That's why Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days in Matthew four, and he came against the enemy and the Lord taught him, God taught him how to speak against the enemy. So I just want to say to you right now, contend for the truth. Get a prayer room, get a war room, you know, get on your face before God. And the greatest gift we can give to this generation is to be intercessors and prayer warriors. So good. Um, so good. Right. We love you, brother. We're so glad. I, I think I just heard uh, rumor mill from my husband that we're going to be doing something with you and pastors in the area and uh, some kind yes, of pastors bro. meeting coming up. We're doing a pastors gathering for all the past. Please. And I would love you guys could invite anyone you can. This is for Gen Z in September. But I believe, don't don't quote me here, uh, I believe Michael Miller from Upper Room and Lou Engel will be joining that pastor's gathering um, that weekend. We're trying to lock in everything, but uh, we're, we're so excited to come. Amen. Well, you can begin praying for that right now. Everyone that's listening, you're the first to hear, but begin to pray. God is stirring. Don't miss the winds of revival. God is moving. So, hey, thank you so much for being with me, Brian. What a what a lovely opportunity to share with you today. You're just a great friend, and we uh, so appreciate you and your ministry. Oh, thank you so much, Pastor. I appreciate it. And for everyone that's watching, this is Real and Honest Conversation with Tam Talks. Make sure that you go down and click that notification bell right now and join us for all of our YouTube videos. Check me out on our podcast. Would you please share this with someone today? A mama, a papa that's a prayer warrior or a Gen Zer, and let them know what God's doing. We appreciate you guys so much. Till next time, God bless. Have a great day. <music>